Hey everybody, welcome to episode 78 of Making It. I'm on the back porch of the house. I'm Bob Claggett here with Jimmy DiResta. Hey guys, how you doing? I'm upstate. Hey Just as awesome. noisy as you, sorry. <laughs> and David Picciuto. Hey, I'm where I'm always at, home. Nice, nice. That's cool. I am currently on vacation in Kentucky, where I grew up. So I'm in the backyard, so you might hear some wind and birds and cars and motorcycles and stuff like that. So I get to be Jimmy this week and bring all the noise. You know, the, the, the noise sounds like the, the Macintosh bird whistles. So you could just say that you're uh, using <laughs> okay. the, the Mac can, yeah. the can sound. What have you guys been up to? Uh, so I am working on a project. It should be done, but I now have to start over. Uh, I, I, uh, if you don't know, I now have an assistant with me on Tuesdays. And he, today was his first day, and he helped me shoot the vlog. And then we went right into shooting the project video, which was taken. We made cookies. We made chocolate chip cookies. And then we took one of the nicer shaped ones, and um, we were going to encase that in epoxy with the uh, index card of the, with the, uh, the, the recipe, all kind of framed and encased in epoxy. And so... We we cut all the wood and we get everything all set. We make the we make the frame and, and the little box where everything is going to sit in, and we position the cookie right where we want it. We position the, the the index card was mounted on some masonite, and we have that position right where we want it. And it's, it takes a whole thing of epoxy, like the like you know the the two full bottles mixed together. We pour it in, and we come to find out that cookies float in epoxy. A lot of stuff floats in epoxy. Yeah, you got <laughs> you got to glue it down. Huh? And um, once you're to that point, there is no going back. Yeah, there's no saving it. So uh, we were trying different things. We were like, I had a tip. Like a pencil. I, I could tell oh. you a tip. Yeah, a please. Of, well, if you had it, you could either cut like a sliver of acrylic or like you know, if I have acrylic thin diameter rods like you know like eighth inch thin diameter acrylic rods you could push that in and the acrylic will will go nearly invisible inside of that stuff oh i don't know that hmm. i had any acrylic for that so i was with we okay uh we'll take a pencil and we'll kind of hold it in place and then uh had weight on top of the pencil that, and we thought maybe if we let it sit for like an hour and then come back and remove the pencil it would be thick enough or the cookie would stay down or the cookie would soak up enough epoxy no, it's a it's a whole bubbly mess, and so I don't know. You know and we all know like epoxy is kind of expensive, and it took a whole, a whole case of this stuff. So uh, gonna gonna start over, but uh, it was fun to shoot because it was fun to shoot with somebody else there because the whole thing was kind of like handheld, and I had somebody to interact with. And I'm trying to get rid of the voiceovers and do like the live talking. And so mm -hmm. I'm trying trying this new style and trying to make it more fun. And then uh, I guess when you have a failed project like that and everything is going wrong, that's that's pretty fun. Yeah, <laughs> one thing one thing to do is uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna do anything that floats, pour a little puddle in the bottom of your display, whatever it is, and then let it cure. And so now it's it's liquefied and solidified rather to the bottom of wherever you want it. So you know, fill it up right up to the surface of whatever the object is. Let it cure for a day. And now it's glued in place with the material, and then you pour on top of it, and it sticks to itself, and you don't see the seam at all. Mm, nice. So if you have a bunch of things, like for instance, my my nephew uh, made the thing with lighters, and he he had all the lighters laid out, and then the lighters all floated. So that would have been a good example where if he let them all just kiss the bottom of the material, let it cure for a day, and then filled it up, they would have all been glued in place with the material, and then then they would have been engulfed in the material. So. Huh. So you live and learn. You'll never not do that live again. You'll never, you'll <laughs> ever, ever, ever. Yeah. Especially, you know, all this excitement is attached to it. You know, you won't be like, oh, damn, I did that again. This time you'll right. never remember, you'll never forget. Yep. So I've been, uh, I, did I talk about the printing press last episode? I can't remember, but obviously I, I put out the video today uh, that they were recording. I put out a video of me using the printing press finally. And I did that a couple, I guess. Before the weekend, I got up here Thursday night to pick up Taylor for Friday morning because uh, Taylor's been building a lot of chairs up here, so it's, it's easier for her to work up at the house. And I have my shop and projects going in the city, so I come up, hang out with her for a couple of days. The work week comes, I go down, and then I come back up and pick her up if we have a rental. 
occasionally we have rentals. And uh, anyway, so I came up last Thursday night and I was so anxious. I had my printing plate. I had the, the proper ink. I had everything. And I had never printed ever before in my life. And I was like, I got to... I got to just give it a try, you know, whatever, whatever happens, I'll figure it out. I never cleaned rollers. I never wiped that ink up. I bought every, I bought mineral spirits. I bought naphtha. I bought alcohol, all the things, all the different people say that you should use. And I just went for it. And my, in hindsight, I learned a tremendous amount just jumping in, but I, I realized the paper I used, although it's cool, sturdy paper, it's not best for that ink because the ink is still drying on the paper. That's why I haven't put them out for sale yet. The, and if it's a little bit thick, the ink is still drying. So I'm waiting. And the paper was so hard. It's like, it's like really firm chipboard. It didn't take an impression the way like you would expect letterpress to take an impression. So uh, it just wasn't the right paper for the right job. But it was paper I found in the street. Me and Dave Welder found it in the street a couple of years ago. We, ha- we have a whole bunch of it and I used the last of it. And uh, it was a great learning experience, how not to get my fingers jammed in. And I realized in hindsight, I had the printing press running in the wrong direction. So, uh, you know, it probably would have performed better if I had it running in the correct direction. And uh, so it, I, I, it was successful. The funny thing, the, the, the reason I'm, I'm bringing it up is because I was so excited to do it. I started printing at two in the morning. I didn't finish till four. So when you see the video, that's all at like between two, three and four a.m. when um, I'm, doing, I'm doing all that printing. And I have flashlights like magnetized all over the machine so that I could see the video. And uh, I just was afraid because the next morning we only had a few hours before the tenants came. We had to literally leave here by noon. So I just said, let me just go for it and clean up. And uh, it was great. And David, I saved you the very first print because you tweeted and said, I want the very first one. So the very first one that came off those rollers is yours. I wrote on the back. And uh, so I'm going to have those on my website uh, in the next week or so. And I, 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 uh, I, I, as I sign them, I'll hand number them, and yours is definitely number one. So, because I only know yours is one, the rest are all out of order. Because I had like good 10 in a row, and then I realized I was running out of ink, and so they were kind of printing lightly. And then you'll notice in the video where I, I like literally stopped the machine and put a sliver of paper behind the, uh, the coating of plastic. And that's enough to just literally make the difference between where the pressure is on the printing plate. And uh, so, it's, it's a tremendous learning experience. Go ahead, Dave. That's cr- that's called relief print, right? When you have um, a raised object covered with ink and then onto the paper? You know, I'm, I famously don't know the definitions of anything I do, so I just call printing. <laughs> it, it, if I remember from my graphic design school days, that is called a relief print. Maybe. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I know once I put this video out, I was going to get a lot of people... Uh, I, I haven't been getting too many trolls lately, you know, in, in the last 10, 12 videos, no one's been mean to me, but I've been nothing but nice. So I've been getting tons of constructive criticism and uh, really great suggestions. And, you know, I get my email out right away and I start having a private conversation with a lot of guys. And so uh, it's been really fantastic learning experience. And I'm looking forward to trying this new machine that I got. My dad found a couple weeks ago. I don't know if we had spoke, but my dad said, come out to Long Island and well, let's have dinner and I'll show you this printing machine. And this was just before July first, I think. And I came and I looked at it and I said, I said to my dad, I go, I'm never, I'm not coming back here. And the house was sold and everything was going to go by July 7th, which I don't know if it was today. That's today, July, today's July 5th. 5th. Yeah. So I knew this week I wouldn't have time to go back to the house. So I just looked at my dad. I was like, we could take it now. I go, how you feeling? Are you feeling strong? And he goes, let's do it. And so we took the machine apart. I didn't really, I just Snapchatted it a little bit. And so we took the machine apart and carried the heavy parts up the steps uh, together and then alone for the smaller parts, got it in my truck. And so then I got it together here in my container and it's in great shape. And so I'm looking forward to printing with that one in another video. And I started my bench build video. I'm doing some work with Lincoln now. So Lincoln Welding is asking me to do a, like kind of a, a semi-epic video per quarter for them. So um, I just did my bench video. And I'm um, cutting that together right now. So that'll be out. That's going to be on my channel and their channel. So you'll see it on my channel first, probably. And uh, yeah. What does semi-epic mean? Just something that's like, uh, <laughs> that's my own thing. I told them I would do it that. Just, you know, like not making, like in the video of the printing press, I made, I took like five cuts and I made that little piece that goes on the machine, you know. I could have, if I was some other YouTubers, I could have turned that into like five videos. But for me, it's got to have lots of steps. And so like a good, like chunky 15 minute video, 12 or 13 minute video. And this, this, uh, bench video has turned out pretty good and it's outside my shop. So if anybody in the tri-state area wants to come and visit me, if I'm not around, you could sit on the bench and take a picture. 
Hashtag to rest the bench. Yeah. It looks really awesome. It Thank looks you. Really it nice. was fun. It really came out. Uh, it really came out better than I expected. So I was super proud of it. And I have this like motorcycle handcuff. So I put a I put an eyelet bolted to the building, and then I welded an eyelet on it, which you'll see in the video. And I handcuffed it. Hopefully, it's still there. And the, the woman at, who owns the shop that is right above me, she's a hair salon, Brianna. I texted Brianna today. I said, "Hey, is she?" I hadn't seen her, and she wasn't around. Just the, her employees were there. So I said, "Hey, is the bench still there?" I go, "I don't know." If, and she goes, "Oh my!" I sent her a picture. She went, "Oh my god, I've been away. I haven't seen it." She goes, "I hope it's still there." She goes, <laughs> "Let me ask my one of my guys," but no one's emailed me yet to say because I haven't been home since Saturday. So. I put it out there Saturday, handcuffed it, did my final shots and walked away. It's the last time I saw it. So hopefully wow. it's still there. Yeah. Nice. So that was a fun build. And, uh, and I started a cannon build. I'm going to do like a little uh, English 1600 cannon on my lathe. So I'm going to do that. It's going to be about 20 inches long with all the details. And I'm actually hoping to fire it. So that'll be fun. Oh, man. Sweet. Yeah, so I got a lot of good builds going. And Dangerous. Yeah, so I'll, I'll probably only fire it once or twice if that first one doesn't work. And then I'll put it on the shelf. But, so I got a, a lot of good builds started, and I have a couple good ideas. Tomorrow I have to build a video all day. And by the way, I also now have a new assistant. You guys remember when we did a lecture and somebody asked me if I take assistance, and I say, I always say yes, but nobody ever shows up. You guys remember said that during Mega Fair, people always say, hey, can I be yeah. your assistant for a couple of days? I said, sure. But nobody ever shows up or follows up. And this young man, uh, Wanse in Korea, wrote to me and said, I would love to come and be your assistant. I said, well, when are you going to be in New York? He goes, I'll come if you'll have me be your assistant. I said, yeah, if you get here, just call me. And like, he sent me one other email, said I'm working on it. And then another email saying, I'm in New York at my cousin's house. When can I start? <laughs> and he came to the Amazing. city. Wow. And he, yeah, he's in the picture with me when I, I cause he's from uh, Gung, Gungnam, Gungnam, Korea. So he, he put on his glasses and goes Gungnam style. So he's in the picture on my Instagram <laughs> with me and him. So he helped me with the bench the whole day. I mean, he kind of more watched, but he certainly did help me from, uh, from time to time. But I just said, he goes, how do I integrate into your system? I said, just watch and, you know, a natural flow will start to occur. And so he, he started Saturday, the day I built that bench and Sunday morning. So those are his first two days. So that was fun. He just showed up and he's like, when do I start? So he, he doesn't speak very good English at the moment. So his cousin came down to visit me with him and he was our translator for a few minutes. So Saturday and Sunday, we were talking to each other through Google Translator all day. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's cool. Yeah. How long is he going to be around? Four weeks. He's going to stay around for four weeks. He's an opera singer. He's a 26-year-old opera singer. He graduated college. Oh, wow. And and he doesn't know how to make anything. Hmm. He just likes what I do. So he came. That's, cool. that's awesome. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a great story. I'm going to put a, it. That's a good it. opportunity to share some information with somebody that doesn't have any experience, you know? Yeah. That's, yeah. He's going he's gonna to be in some yeah. of the Snapchats and he, he's, uh, he's going to be in that video. He's in the end sitting on the bench with me. Well, I have been traveling, so I haven't really been up to much of anything. Um, but you were talking earlier about not having any trolls or many trolls yeah. lately. Yeah. Um, uh, I actually hadn't, hadn't for a while either. And I was like, wow, you know, the climate is starting to loosen and like people are starting to be nice. And there's always, you know, somebody. But and then I put out the uh, the cereal ridiculous snack <laughs> machine video last week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, wow, they all came back real quick. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's called the ridiculous snack machine, right? I, I, I know. Should, exactly. That should take care of all trolls right there. You, you would think so. And yeah, I mean, it's it's like obviously overbuilt and, uh, you know. The Arduino is unnecessary. The stepper motor is unnecessary. It's like, it was fun, and it was a learning experience. And so I haven't taken any of the, these comments to heart or anything, but um, it's amazing when you do something that's unnecessary, how many people come out and, and point that out to you, even though you're right, ridiculous <laughs> is in the title, so it should have been really obvious. <laughs> but it's funny because, um, you know, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people loved it as well, so I'm not trying to discount that, but I a lot it. of people... Well, thanks. A lot of people, you know, made comments about like, what is this? What's ha You're out of ideas, stuff like that. So if that's the case, they're going to love next week's or this week's, I guess, by the time you hear this will be out because I made He-Man's shield. Oh, right on. <laughs> so, <laughs> unnecessary. Ridiculous. Totally unnecessary. I'm not going to like cosplay as He-Man or anything. I just wanted to have the He-Man shield. And really, it was a way for me to start learning some of the, uh, the foam fabrication, the EVA format you know, foam format stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like a shape that has some depth, but it's not 
curvy and it's not, you know, uh, it, it's kind of an in-between to get started in that world. So I, I'm really happy with how it came out though. Nice. Um, so that, that'll be up on Thursday. Past that, I actually have, I've been trying to get ahead for so long and this is the last thing I have shot. So when I get back from this trip, I'm going to be trying to work really hard to catch up and get ahead again. It's just the way it seems to go. Uh, every time I get ahead, it gets used up. Uh, I was saying the only schedule I commit to is Make Magazine, you know, and so everything else just falls apart. And and I'm trying really hard, like, this week to to not, like, think about that too much and just enjoy the fact that I'm, you know, away with my kids and have fun with family and all that stuff. So when I get back, I'm going to have to put the hammer down or pick the hammer up, I guess, however you want to think about it. But, uh, so, Jimmy, you had something you wanted to talk about this week, or an idea you want to fill us in there? Oh, yeah, I was just talking about how, you know, I had a few good days, and then today when we were kind of contemplating a subject uh, through text message, it occurred to me, all day long I'm waiting for something bad to happen. And you guys ever have that feeling when, like, things are going good, I I got a couple videos under my belt, and I'm feeling accomplished, and, you know, my client work is on time, and, 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 and being well accepted. And then, like, I'm, like, expecting, like, some bad letter in the mail or something. It's just, it seems like, you know, crisis, I, I, the way I put it is crisis is always imminent. It's just a matter of, like, how and when you get it and then what you do with it when you get it. And so I just wanted to bring that up as a subject because, you know, from time to time as makers, we, you know, we find out, you know, we have to leave our space. And a good example I brought up was when my brother and his son, Matt, they literally found out on, like you know, like a Wednesday that they had to be out by Friday. And that was a matter of zoning and their landlords getting letters from the, the town that they weren't allowed to be renting. And so my brother as one tenant and like three other tenants on the lot, they all had to leave by Friday. So talking about crisis, when you think everything's going good and then you get like a curveball out of nowhere. And it's like, how do you, how do you deal with that? And, you know, how do you keep going forward and just, you know, uh, what helps me personally is just keeping my eye on the goal and knowing that it's not a perfectly straight line towards that goal. And you're going to have to make some, yeah. some dips and curves and turns and, you know, uh, it, you know, and, uh, you know, just try to avoid any medical emergencies. You know, like the day I was, the day I injured my finger, I had a, like seven things planned that evening. And then all of a sudden I'm laying in the hospital and none of those things mattered. What mattered most was that I, you know, figure out how to heal my hand. So, you know, life throws you a curveball, and it's just a matter of how you deal with it without without going off the rails. You know, from time to time, you get hit with these curveballs, and all of a sudden, like our path is completely changed. You know, depends on what what that what that is. You know, yeah, I mean that happens to to all of us in a a smaller scale that maybe we don't recognize as the same thing. You know, within a single project, you know, you have uh, you know you cutting something, you cut something the wrong way. And it's the last piece of trim you have. And then what do you do? Um, the cookie you know, floats. You, yeah, exactly. The cookie floats. You know, I made this bench. Excellent title, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I made this bench uh, that I'm uh, talking about. And <clears throat> I made a total rookie mistake. And I cut the two rear legs two inches too short. And I looked over at Wante and I was like, I just screwed this up. And I was like, you know what? Let me weld them on and see how it feels. Because now, now the, the bench is going to be kicked back, you know, about 10 degrees. And I put it on and we both sat in it and we both looked at each other and go, feels perfect. So I was about to have it, you know, be totally level, the, 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 the butt of the chair be totally level with the, or totally parallel with the ground. But by accidentally cutting it, I kicked it back a certain amount and it was perfect. So... I said, I was about to recut them. I was like, you know, before I recut them, let me just tack them on. So in the video, you'll notice me just tack them in place. I don't really drive them home as far as the welding goes. I did off camera. But uh, I just tack them in place just to set it off the horses and give it a try. So, I mean, again, you know, everything was going smooth. I was cutting, making all my cuts perfect. I had one piece of metal in case I made a mistake. And uh, anyway, I was able to pull it pull it out. But th- yeah, sometimes the cookie floats and you just got to figure out how to make it work. I, I think we find that we are most creative when we're put in a situation like that. We try, at least I do, I, I try to plan out the project. 
and I know how it's going to start, and I know how it's going to finish. And when those when those little when those little situations happen, you can use that as a as a great learning experience, as like a design change, or I know the next time to never have the cookie float or anymore or what whatever it is and you'll you'll find like you can it just breeds creativity because you have to overcome that with some other with with a, with a plan b and you just never know that how plan b is going to turn out maybe it's probably going to come out better than than before or at least you're going to come out with more knowledge than you did before you know that remind it reminds me of um, just something. You know, I grew up with comedians and a lot of my, of course, hanging out with my brother, and then I met a lot of comedians with my brother. Um, but and I'm dating myself. But a lot of the comedians, the one thing they all loved most about Johnny Carson was that he could handle anything, any conversation with anybody, an old woman, a little kid, you know, a monkey peeing on top of his head, you know, anything he could handle and make it funny. And I like to believe that I could do the same thing with making stuff. You know, again, it's just, I'm just drawing a parallel. I don't think I'm a comedian, but drawing a parallel in the way that anything that goes wrong, I could figure out how to make it work to my advantage. And it just comes with years of experience and, you know, developing confidence through just repetitive work. But, uh, you know, again, just any crisis, whether it's a flat tire or, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I went out to my truck and actually I got an email. I probably told you this. I get an email from Chevy that says, you got a flat tire, by the way. It says, oh, by the way, your tire's flat. So I walk out to my car 20 feet away and my tire's flat because I have OnStar. So if anybody has a Chevy, they know you can just, the car will just tell you what's wrong with it. So I went out to my car and I still had enough air in it to drive, but I thought to myself, all right, let me just feel around and see if I could find why there's a flat tire. And it was almost flat. And I felt the screw. And this is in the middle of the night. So I break my flashlight out and there's a screw there. So I break out my plug kit, which I keep in the truck. And I plug the tire right there and then. And now I needed to put air in the tire. So as to avoid like running the tire off the rim, because there was such low air in it, I went and I had a reserve tank of air. And I walked back and forth to my shop like three times to fill the tire up with air. So right there and then, I wasn't expecting to deal with a flat tire at 11 o'clock at night. But by 11.20, it was all put to bed. You know, and it's just a matter of how you deal with this, like, little bits of, of crisis, you know, major and, and minor. And uh, I personally like to just confront it head on and just, like, figure it out. And, you know, if it's, if it's, a, if I'm having a problem with, you know, a person, I'll just immediately call them and say, well, let's try and work this out. Um, you know, if it's a problem with a bill or the government, let's just confront it, get my, you know, if I need my lawyer, hopefully I would never need my lawyer. But if <laughs> I need my lawyer, I say, let's go sort this out. I got audited many years ago, so I had to deal with all that. And it was just dealt it head on, you know, I didn't avoid it. I have this 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 little personal struggle that I have in my head. I don't really like to have a plan B because I'm all in on plan A. But there has to be a plan B for crazy disasters, right? So, you know, I'm lucky enough where I've never been kicked out of my shop or I've, you know, I've never had to start completely over. Like that could happen. There could be a fire. I could chop off a finger. Then you have to go to plan B, right? And, yeah. and I, I almost, I, I, I don't want a disaster to happen, but I almost welcome that uh, something to drastically change because, okay, if I couldn't do woodworking anymore, we're, we're going to move on to art. Or uh, I could always go back to the previous career of, web design but hopefully that never happens you know but but i want to know how you guys do you guys have a plan b or are you like me where you are more you're all in on plan a and pl you'll you'll make up plan b as it as it comes along i mean for me you know like i always talk about problem solving and i look at that type of stuff in just this whole conversation in general as <clears throat> it's just a bunch of problems right and how you decide to solve um and you know, how, how much effort you want to put into solving whatever thing is thrown in your way kind of defines who you are and like how you're going to move forward in any given situation. And so if you're talking about uh, career wise, if I have a plan B, no, I don't. Because in this career, as I look at it now, I am the driving force behind what I create, how I'm able to go about it. And of course, there's a lot of other factors that are outside of just me. But, like, this is only happening because I decided that I wanted to try to do it. Nobody's forcing me to do it. Nobody's in control of you know, me wanting to create things or whatever. So even if I were to cut off a hand, 
I'm still here wanting to create things. The problem solving comes in, well, okay, now that I only have one hand, how do I create things with one hand? You know, uh, so it's, it's more about Is this a Star like, Wars reference? <laughs> no, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he went on to be a Jedi, the great Jedi, you know. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's more about like, okay, here are the new variables. Now I can redefine the variables. Uh, I have one hand to deal with. What jobs can I do? Or how can I express the, the creation that I want to make with one hand? Or with no shop? Or with whatever. Um, so I don't personally have a plan B. Um, and before you answer that, Jimmy, I want to hop back real quickly to, David, you were saying something earlier about how you like to make plans and you like to, you know, the beginning and the end. Um, now I do the exact same thing. I like to try in my head to map out an entire project, start to finish, figure out as many of the problems that I think I'm going to run to. Um, the problem with that, which is probably what kind of what you're saying, is that when we, when we try to take our creative juice and decide to design a thing, and to look at the end product, we are looking at the potential for that end product only through the lens of our experiences and only through the lens of like our, you know, what we have on hand, how we expect things to go. And so we are kind of limiting what could be, you know, because we're only like using our faculties of what we have, the information we have on hand to create that projection of like, this is what this thing is going to look like. But you get halfway through the project and all of your wood catches on fire and you have to figure out another way to do it, then you have a new set of things that you never would have thought through otherwise, you know? So as frustrating as that would be to randomly have all your wood catch on fire in the middle of a project, it would force you to be in a place that you would never be otherwise. Yeah, you know? that's probably so, how that trend started about 15 years ago when people started burning stuff and making things out of it. <laughs> They're like, my design is not interesting enough. Let's just burn it all. <laughs> no, it, it all caught on fire spontaneously, and the guy kept building. So, did you? What do you? What about Plan Bs for you, Jimmy? Do you have a Plan B? Uh, you know, I think every single day I enact, <laughs> I put Plan B into effect. It's just, it's one big hustle. You know, when you live in New York City, money flows like water in and out of your pockets. And uh, so I, that's why we're trying to get out of the city so we could try and conserve a little bit. But um, again, that's, that's a long-term goal. I, it, I've had a lot of plan Bs with this, you know, this idea of making my make, maker space. You know, I've, I've come close to gathering mortgages and not being able to do so. So um, I, I have a lot of plan Bs with different plans. But as far as my life goes, my life is just one big problem-solving scheme, you know, from day to day. It's just like how to problem solve through this and, you know, living partly here this, this year, living partly here and living partly in the city, uh, more so for the first time in the entire time I've owned this house, I'm kind of sharing my time more than ever. Um, you know, that, that invokes lots of little problem solves as far as like dealing with my schedule and knowing where I'm going to be, when, and how I'm going to deal with it. And, uh, yeah, you know, so every single day is just a series of, of plan A's and B's. The other day, uh, me and Willie, we, we Snapchatted it a little bit. We were going to try and lift the container up so I could move it back, so I could begin to develop a shop between my two containers. And I bought this you know, $75 jack, and I stuck it under the thing, and I get one crank, and the handle snapped right off. And I looked at Willie. I go, we got to go to plan B. It's <laughs> a brand new jack. I literally snapped the handle off before it made one click. So, And it's supposed to lift 8,000 pounds, which I figured just half the container has got to be less than 8,000 pounds, and it's not even full. So, you know, we, uh, we ended up buying little compression bottle jacks, which seemed to work better, but move a lot less. But, uh, you know, so there's lots of plan A's and B's in, in every little project. You know, I, uh, just the other day, I bought these giant drill bits off of, off of eBay. It was $100 for a lot of these three, three drill bits. And the drill bits, they're on my Instagram. They're, they're like an inch and an eighth, an inch and three, three eighths, and like an, an inch and a sixteenth. So the three different diameters, three different lengths. But they have a taper on the back, and the guy's description said taper four, which does not fit my lathe. But in the description inside the inside the listing, it said taper three. So I, I went to email him, and I looked. I'm like, I don't have any time to wait for an answer. This auction's going to end in just a few hours. So I just bought them. I figured, let me give it a shot. And I bought them, and they're wrong. But I figured there's got to be a you know a jump between. I, I kind of thought about it, and I was talking with Tom Utley, and, and he sent me a link to the thing that solves my problem. So. 
uh, anyway, so just like little things like that, like every project has its own A and B plans. I also bought other drill bits that night, which seemed to have a very sturdy description of Taper 3, which will fit my lathe. And those came in today down in the city. So I'll look at them when I get downstate. So, you know, every 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 plan has a an A, B, and C. But my life is just one big A plan. That was a long answer. I'm sorry. I like it. So I have a, a question about that, kind of. Well, it's kind of related. So... Obviously, we go through changes. Um, you know, we we decide to change careers or we whatever changes throughout our life. A lot of those are self imposed. You know, we decide that we want to do this thing. What's a place kind of like? Uh, you know, you were saying about your brother and your nephew. They had a change forced on them. What's what's a change for each of you guys, David? Maybe you go first. What's a change that was not something you were looking for, but something that was you know kind of big in your life that you had to to work around? And how did you work around it? You know, I think I've been pretty darn lucky in the fact that there hasn't been any instant life-changing things for me. They've all just been these little things, and and I've worked around them. Or maybe they were big, but I just broke them down into smaller problems. But I really can't think of, like, a hard example. Um, The first time I went the completely freelance route I was still doing web design and I thought oh I can do this on my own and I got a couple of projects right away at the beginning of summer I'm like things are going good this is I'm on the right track this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life and then by the end of the summer I had I ran out of freelance projects and so the big change was I either have to get a job or I have to move back home <laughs> with the, with the folks, and so you know, I, I and I went and got a job, and it turned out it was the best job I've ever had at at that point. So that's that's probably the biggest change that that comes to mind right now is just you know not things not going as expected with my career, but making it just making it work. Uh, is I guess you know the, I'm obviously thinking of my hand injury, which you know was a total left field thing, which happened in 2010. It's quite a while now, but in hindsight, you know, uh, um, you know, I got to be more. I got to be. I guess you might want to say internet famous since then. So I get to be an advocate for that. You know, just saw safety. So that's it's it's a good thing that came out of it. And then immediately after I left the hospital, I had a lot of things to to get done. And so my dad said, "Hey, let me come to the city and hang out, and I'll and I'll try and help. I'll be a pair of hands for you." He goes, "I'll let you run the show. I won't say a word." which was a complete role reversal because every other time that he and I worked together, he was in charge and I just had to keep my mouth shut and avoid getting yelled at. And uh, so it was, it was actually really, it was a really wonderful couple of days that my dad and I got to work together, which never would have happened. I would just keep streaming through my life and just making things and finishing deadlines and stuff. And so for the first time in many, many years, my dad came to my shop and hung out literally for eight or nine hours, two days in a row. And we got to work together and he's like, I can't believe, you know, that I don't get to see this more often and, uh, you know, how, how, how I work and cause he lives in Long Island, I live in the city. So that was a silver lining there. You know, it's actually, uh, you know, it, it's, it was uh, a really, really, uh, precious gift, I guess you could say without being too sappy, you know, that he and I got to work together like that because we never would have, you know, if I hadn't injured myself and needed help with my, my injured foot, um, injured hand. <laughs> I don't know why I said foot. I just read the article about the guy that got his foot exploded in Central Park. So I hope that's not a trend. Did you guys hear that story? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the the newspaper is on my table, and that's what made me say that. God forbid. Um, Anyway, so... You know, that's one situation. And then there's been several times where, you know, I've gone financially belly up. You know, I was working for a guy, and I was making a lot of money. And my brother Joseph and I were were a subcontractor internally at a company. And he came, he said, you know, come in my office. And we knew things weren't good at the company, but he said, this is your last paycheck. He goes, I'm sorry. He goes, I I, I couldn't do any better than being able to at least give you a last full paycheck. And that was it. And so I was like on my own with no severance package, no nothing. And that was in 2003 or four. Anyway, I was able to pull through that without a problem, but you know, it, there was some major learning experiences there, there and then, and that, and one of them was, you know, try not to have all your eggs in one basket. And you know, now I make income from YouTube, I make income from Patreon, I make income from this, I make income from my website, and of course, my client work. So you know, in any given month, 
have several streams of income. And so that, that was a thing that came out of that, you know, yeah. unforeseen circumstance. You know, I was living comfortably knowing I was going to get X amount of money every month. And then one day they just said, here, this, the spigot has been turned off and that's it. See, David, we can, we can fire him and he'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> but Jimmy does bring up a good point of like all, all three of us, we have multiple streams. I have, I know there's eight streams of different sources of income so if youtube suddenly says you broke our terms of service you're out of here uh that's going to be devastating but i still have i'm still selling plans i still have um ad revenue on my website i'm still i still have patreon and so uh there's there's many things and i think all three of us are we have things in place to make sure we don't go under or if things are starting to turn south uh, we're going to be okay because we have time to make that, that pivot or that change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point uh, for me about the change thing. Um, so I was in, and I've talked about this before, but in case anybody didn't hear the story, when I was, um, I, I started a company, web development company, we sold it to an ad agency. And so when I sold it to the ad agency, I went to work for them, but I was kind of at the top of our division. You know, I was, I was the boss of the first thing. So I was the, vice president or president or whatever of the second thing. And so, you know, I was getting paid really well. I didn't have to do as much work. I didn't have to hustle as much as like I did when I was actually running everything. And I just kind of got complacent and comfortable. And I didn't have a lot of motivation to like, you know, to really continue to try super hard. And uh, so one day they came in and they told us, we're moving your entire office to Hilton Head, which is about 45 minutes away from Savannah. Um, and we were, they were moving us out of a building that my ex-partner and I owned. And they were paying rent to us to pay for the building. So they said, not only, basically, we're, we're not going to pay you anymore for your building, so you have to figure that out. And you have to commute 45 minutes or an hour both ways. <laughs> and I was like, Two nope. kicks. <laughs> <laughs> Two kicks. That's not happening. <laughs> And I mean, I, I really, that was absolutely the kick that I needed. Of course, I didn't want to have to deal with that. But that drove me to like, okay, I need to work. I need to actually be driven to work again. Um, and I have to find something that's going to work better for, you know. And, and so through that process, I started being able to, I got an awesome job, being able to work from home, which then gave me more time to start doing video stuff on the side, which then turned into this. So, you know, looking back in like the long view, that was one of the best things that could have happened to me long term. At the, at the time, I was like, oh, no, I've got a nine month old kid and I just bought a new house and I have to find a new job or lose two hours a day with that kid. You know, like, well, that sucks. But, um, you know, like I said, looking back, it was awesome. And it was it was the, the propellant that I needed at that exact time for one, to get me to where I am now, but also to get me just like back to actually working, you know, to like making an effort in my job because I was just at a place where I didn't really have to try very hard anymore. And that's not good for anybody, I don't think. But Yeah. No, there are, there are always like the, we, each one of us, every, every human being could think back to that moment in time where, you know, you were confronted with something, but out of it grew something better. You know, even if it's a relationship, I'm thinking in terms of, uh, you know, personal relationship, I had that ended not due to my own decision. And so I was a little heartbroken, but in hindsight, I mean, I grew a thousand times from that, you know? Yeah. And so the situation with my job, you know, my injury, your job, you know, these things make yeah. you better. And that's, you know, that's how you deal with them. Can I tell another one real quick? And then we can yeah. wrap up just because you said the relationship thing. Most people, you guys probably don't even know this story. Um, I was engaged to a girl before I met with my wife. We dated for like three years. We were engaged. Um, and it was kind of rocky after we got engaged, but it was one of those like, we'll figure it out kind of deals. So she came in one day and said, we're done. Like, I'm calling this off. We just need to, to move on. So totally out of my control. I couldn't say no, you know, I couldn't do anything about it. <clears throat> so the next day, a good friend of mine was going, um, he was a chaperone with a college group to go on a ski trip. And I was like, man, I need to get away. Can I join you guys, <laughs> you know, something just to, to leave town? It's like, yeah, sure. So I'm all heartbroken. Um, the next, this is the next day I go get on this bus. I look forward and my wife is two seats in front of me. 
I met her the next day. <laughs> That's and, an incredible um, story. Yeah. And so we, you know, we got to know each other on that trip. We started dating very quickly after that. We got engaged several months after that and then married like just over a year later. Wow. So that's one of those things. Can I, like, ask, can I ask, how long yeah. did it take your ex to come back and say, I didn't mean it? Because <laughs> she heard you were doing good. <laughs> Actually, a few months, but yeah. <laughs> it yeah. happens every time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just anyway. a quick formula for everybody that doesn't have experience with girls. If you want a girl to like you, just ignore her. <laughs> if your girlfriend broke up with you, just say, okay, great, and ignore her. You'll have her in the palm of your hands in just a couple of weeks. <laughs> that's Does that I just, work that's, my it. Wife? that's my Can book on dating. That's all it is. Just, just <laughs> ignore her, and you'll get everything you want. <laughs> Don't listen to Jimmy. Just, just say that. <laughs> cool. Um, you guys got anything else on this? Or we want to wrap up? No, that was good. I mean, there's a lot of deep subject matter there. And I think, uh, I think it came off good. You know, you just got to keep your eye on your goals and move forward and navigate the rocky roads. Go with the flow. Yeah. Yeah. Th- that stuff's going to happen to all of us in all different scales and all the time. And I, I think you just got to be willing to try to work through stuff and, you know, look at, look ahead um, you guys been watching anything cool? See, I have not, but uh, um, <laughs> y- y- we have I mentioned Scam School before? I don't think I have. I, I, have. I watched yeah. them. I've watched them. I watched them. All right. So, all right. So, if I have mentioned Sam School, I'm going to go to my backup, and this is I just discovered this channel a few days ago called DIY Creators, and uh, it's a, just another DIY channel. But there's some really good design stuff on here. I like it. Uh, I like like the flow of it, and it's it's got fifty thousand subscribers. I don't know how I'm just finding out about it now, but check it out. I just uh, started a conversation with um, Tom from Exo Tools. It's X O T O O L company, so it's a Exo Tool company. And Tom is a machinist and a, and an artist in the machine room. And he and I just uh, started a conversation. We might do a collaboration. So I've been checking out his videos. So again, I'm kind of, I got like one toe in the machining world. And so we'll see where that goes, but uh, check him out. Guys, he's a masterful machinist. Um, you, you know, honestly, I don't have one. I, ha- I haven't been watching video because I've been on vacation and I haven't, I'm, my watch later list is super long. Um, let me see here. Wait, wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. I'm looking back through the history, trying to find something. Have you guys heard of PewDiePie? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, so, um, How to Dad. Have you ever heard of How to Dad? No. It's pretty funny. I haven't had to look at that yet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's this dad who has like a toddler, and he just comes up with funny, like... Um, like one of them that I saw recently was to like how to get your baby to clean the house. And it's just him sitting aside and the baby does all this different stuff, but he's, he coaches this kid really well to, and he just plays it straight. And the kid's like doing all this funny stuff. Anyway, might not be funny for everybody, but that, that kind of reminds me of, I don't know where I saw it. I don't know what it's called, but have you guys seen the, the viral videos of the guy who wears the Batman cowl on his face and tells that his dad, dad. did Bat you tell dad, me about yeah. that? How did I find out I'm, about that? I don't know. He's awesome. He yes, tells his yes. family what to do as Batman the whole time. <laughs> so good. They're so annoyed with him half the time. Those are good ones. Cool. Well, um, that's probably it for us this week. Uh, before we go, I want to thank our Patreon supporters, especially Jeremy White, Luis Gonzalez, John Cornwell, and Make, Build, Modify. They're our top contributors over there. And, uh, you know, like like always... Uh, the support that we get for the show that helps us keep doing that all comes from Patreon. So everybody that helps us out over there, even a little bit, we are super grateful for it. And um, yeah. So if you want to support us there, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash making it. And then we also have t-shirts. Oh yeah. Which we always forget to talk about. Man. So I don't, I don't know if anybody's actually bought any of them or not, but <laughs> uh, there's a link on our website makingitpodcast.com and you can go get a shirt if you want a shirt 
That'd be cool. So uh, just one one quick follow up is I'm getting uh, literally people are pounding my door down for these prints I made on the printing press. I'm going to put them on my on my website as soon as uh, Scott, my facilitator, can get them up. And I'm only going to have a hundred for sale. I actually only printed a hundred and ten. I will certainly well, make one of those ten is mine, right? Yes, definitely. Okay, making sure. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna pull a few out for uh, friends and family for sure and. Um, so there'll be a hundred, but I'm going to, if, if they go, I'm going to make another run. So nice. that first hundred, hopefully we'll, we'll net people some, uh, college tuition in the future. I don't know. So <laughs> <I can> continue <laughs> to make, make you money on, on your investments in me. So thank you. Awesome. Well, somebody is mowing the yard, so we should probably go. <laughs> All, right. All right. Bye guys. That was a good one. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next week. I still love you. I almost forgot.